family or friends. And while away, you miss those back home. Day upon day, you desire to do well, to do what you travel to do, and you desire to complete that work and get back home. Finally, when the day arrives and you walk through the door, everybody celebrates. They feel rewarded and so do you. Your long days of travel are over. Now you all get to eat together, laugh together, tell stories together, catch up, cry together, feel good and grateful together. Imagine a dad sees his child for the first time after that long while. The dad wouldn't say, you're good, but what did you get for me? Do you have something for me? And if one of the children has a gift for you, and they made it for you while you were away with crayons and yarn and glue, would the dad say, is this all you have for me? I've been gone and worked so hard for you, and all you have for me is this piece of childish craft? We pray not. Wouldn't it be rather the parent would gladly receive the gift of the child? The gift is a token that the parent was thought of while the, child, while the parent was away. And at the end of the night, when it comes to say goodnight and go to bed, you don't set the child aside and hug the gift. Why would you do that when the child's within reach? You don't set aside the giver and cling to the gift. It's the other way around, isn't it? You set aside the gift and cling to the giver. Why? Because the gift is not the reward. The giver is. The reward is just being home, being where you belong, being back with those who love you and those you love. I say this because sometimes when uh, people talk about rewards in heaven, uh, they might talk like this. There's eternal life and that's secure, but now, what are your rewards? And we just wanna pause, rewind. There's eternal life. Can we just pause there for a second? What have we been saying eternal life is for the last several weeks? It's a city, a new heaven and a new earth. And God dwells there. And that God has called this city holy, which means everything that is good dwells there. And everything that seeks to destroy and harm what is good is gone. It is a global city. That means that every tribe, tongue, and nation is there. And every individual story and cultural story that resonated with and honored the glory of God still remains. Every tear that you have personally known is personally wiped away. You are completely, wholly comforted. And every injustice that was washed over, passed over, criminally resisted, or promoted. God brings justice globally for every human being in every culture. And this place is full of art and architecture, work and creativity, always food, always resources, saturated with urban and rural beauty, and we are at a wedding feast, and we are a bride, and the groom is amazing. He has paid our dowry with his own life, and out of his abundant love and mercy, he has chosen us, and there is no need for the sun or moon because God and the Lamb is the light. And we are full of purpose and dignity like kings and queens who reign. And we have every resource at our disposal to create within the glad purpose of God. And because of that, 
we worship. I mean, we worship wholehearted, full, resurrected, bodied worship of gratitude and praise and thanksgiving. Once we remember what eternal life is, how do we say, yeah, 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 but, but what do I have coming? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Who do you think you are? That everything just described as merciful inheritance that you did not deserve or earn, but through the Lamb by his personal will and testament was bestowed to you? And that wouldn't be enough to saturate your imagination forever. Well, okay. (laughs) Imagine a husband and wife. They love one another. They're faithful to one another. They bear with one another. They seek the good of one another. They delight in each other. They forgive one another. They work hard at their relationship. Why? What What reward are they trying to get for working hard at their relationship? The relationship, that is the reward. So that they can experience it with all the contented and companioned love it's meant to offer. On the wedding night, when the young man and woman give all that they have to each other, their bodies, their trust, their acceptance, their vulnerability, their money and material goods, if one does not say to the other, okay, but what else do you have for me? I mean, is this it? I mean, where's my reward? If something like that happened, we'd say run. We'd call that toxic. It is to violate love. What is the reward from the young man and the woman who waited, 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 waited to be together? Always having to say good night. And now the first night comes where they don't have to say good night. What is the reward? That is the reward. That's what you've worked for. So it is with God. God is the reward and his kingdom and all that he owns and delights in given to you. This pushes back on an idea of an individualist consumer view. Maybe you have it in your heart. You'll see it in different places. Some religions will say, you have individual rewards. Everything you've ever wanted, sex forever. Usually targeted to men, women to serve you. Others will say, you get to choose your own personal bliss. It's just all about you. But heaven is a place of love, global, public justice, public consolation, personal delight. This is the reward. What about these individual rewards? Yes. Now that we know what the reward is, an individual reward is like a birthday present. The reward is the people who love you. They give you a birthday present. Do you remember your birthday present from when you were eight? From when you were 11, 17, 28, 35? Birthday presents fade from memory. The thing that gives us joy and sends us to therapy is not the birthday present, but the nature of the giver. The reward is the giver. And gifts that come from that are only an extension of the giver and take us back to there. The nations rage, but your wrath came and the time for the dead to be judged and for rewarding your servants, the prophets and saints and those who fear your name, both small and great. There's a time coming, Jesus says. And all those who've served him, servants, prophets, saints, any who fear his name, whether they were small or great, 
all of them will be rewarded. The one who receives a prophet in this life, Jesus says, because he is a prophet, will receive a prophet's reward. The one who receives a righteous person because he is a righteous person will receive a righteous person's reward. Why? Because to identify with a a spokesperson for Jesus in that time and place would cost you. It would be much easier not to identify with them. So to identify with them and welcome them is to receive their reward. Jesus tells parables like this. The first came before him saying, Lord, your mina has made 10 minas more. And he said to him, well done, good servant. You have been faithful in a very little. You shall have authority over 10 cities. You remember in the book of Revelation when we looked at the city that's coming down, how every person there will reign, R-E-I-G-N, reign. Here's Jesus. You will have authority over 10 cities. (laughs) I don't know what this means, right? You're sitting there listening. You're like, what? And the second came saying, Lord, your mina has made five minas. And he said to him, and you are to be over five cities. A different parable. For what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word, understands it. He bears fruit and yields, in one case, a hundredfold, and another 60, and another 30. In this life, uh, God has given each of us gifts. We know that now. All of us are here in this place experiencing this same moment. All of us are experiencing it differently. But we're here. And if we were to talk together about what we experienced, we would each learn from each other because there's something you're experiencing that I'm not and someone over here is experiencing that you're not. And together, there is more for us to learn. When we're in the new kingdom, if I were to talk to the apostle Peter or to Mary Magdalene, and I realize that they are over 10 cities, and I am over one city, will I feel sad? No, because there's no rivalry there, no comparison, no pride only love and mercy. And when I think about those two and what they lived in comparison to what I've known and lived, I would feel only glad and want to cheer them on. You go get them. (laughs) I don't know what it is to be turned upside down on a cross and crucified because I love Jesus. Peter does. I don't feel that I deserve. I just can't believe I'm in such company. But here's the thing. How do Jesus' people lead? If they're ruling over 10 cities, how would a Jesus person rule? Jesus has made it plain. They do not exalt it over others like those who don't know him do. Those who lead in Jesus' name do so with humility. They consider the least to be the greatest. (laughs) If I only have one city and I'm in the presence of a Jesus person who has 10, guess what? They're gonna treat me like I'm the greatest. And guess what? I'm looking at them like they're the greatest. And guess what? All we're experiencing is glad contentment, rejoicing at the mercy of the lamb. And here's the thing. I will ask Peter, and so will you. Tell us about the lamb. Tell us about our groom. And he will tell us things we did not know and did not imagine from his earthly life and what he now knows. But here's the thing. We know things he does not. You have followed Jesus in the 21st century. It has meant untangling all these rival stories and locating the actual Jesus as the Bible presents him. Very difficult for you. He had the same problem, just different 
set of circumstances. And this means when we speak to each other, I will learn, but I will also teach out of our testimony. And together we will just constantly learn about our groom and our lamb. You experience something like that now. All of us have been given different gifts. Some of you, you, you're in a Bible study with someone and every time they pray you think, that person knows God. And you yourself don't have a life of prayer like that. In your best moments, you don't envy or begrudge it. You just want to be around it more. You pray for them and spur them on. And then you're talking to another person, and they, through their acts of physical service, have experienced things about Jesus, and you think, oh, I'm all thumbs. I... At your best, you don't begrudge them or envy them. You, you spur them on. You feel grateful just to know them. You want to be around them all the more. And so it will be. Yes, you will have a personal reward. But it too is a part of inheritance. Some are given five cities. Some are given ten cities. And that which you've been given in this life, whether it is little or much, you are small or great, is bountifully welcomed by his mercy. And so even we with our little mustard seeds of faith, We offer it. We don't bury it. We offer it. And we see what it is our Lord will make of it. What does this mean for us? It means this. No more just working for the weekend. (laughs) You have a kingdom, an inheritance that is yours moment by moment, day by day. Paul said it this way, no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest for the day will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. He's saying this, if you build a building and there's a fire, what remains? If the building was built by wood, hay, straw, nothing (laughs) it's burned up if there was gold silver precious stones right so he's saying this each person's life who say they follow Jesus they build on a foundation of Jesus and they seek to untangle themselves from offerings of hay wood and straw so that their life is a Jesus saturated founded life If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. We are motivated, not because we're going to lose the kingdom in Christ, but because the kingdom is the reward. And our great hope then becomes the foundation of our life now. And when we stand before the Lord, those things which weren't of him will not have gotten us anywhere. We will have already had our reward with them. And those things which were founded upon him will remain and endure. And we will find ourselves mercifully with the inheritance given by grace, each with our portion, each with our cities, each with what we've been given to do. Some of us small, some of us great, and yet all of us equally ravished by the joy and love and mercy of the Lamb. This was the Lord Jesus' motivation How is it that Jesus endured the cross? Why didn't he let go of the cross and look for other ways of weekend? He endured it, it says, in verse two there, for the joy that was set before him. 
as he was at the cross, he was looking forward to something else. And that something else was the joy that awaited him. And what is that joy? A city, a new heaven and a new earth where the Father dwells and where he, Jesus, is the groom for the bride, a holy city, a global city with no scarcity of food or resources or urban or rural beauty in which every person from every tribe and tongue out of their forgiveness and dignity works and creates and worships and every injustice is made right and every tear is wiped away. The cross was worth it to purchase that for us. Therefore, he gives us this picture of looking forward and says, on the basis of your reward, live. Let's pray together. Oh Lord, we ask for your mercy that you might open our eyes to the reward and to our own personal reception of this inheritance. And we commit this to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.